Harry Alamon, also known as Harry the Hook, was one of the most feared enforcers for the Chicago outfit. He was a nephew of Joseph Ferriola, who later on became the acting boss of the outfit. Alamon graduated Crane Technical High School in 1956. He then decided to enroll in the Chicago Academy of Fine Arts and studied commercial art. He graduated with a two-year degree. But instead of pursuing a career in the fine arts, he married Ruth Mustari, a widow with four children. To support his family, Alamon was collecting juice loans and protection money for the outfit. He headed up a group of hitmen through the 70s and early 80s, dubbed the Wild Bunch, which consisted of Jerry Scalise, William Butch Petroselli, Anthony Little Tony Barcelino, Jimmy the Ice Pick, Iandino, and Jerry Scarpelli. According to authorities, the Wild Bunch were responsible for almost 50 gangland homicides. The Chicago Crime Commission claims that Harry committed 13 murders between 1971 and 1976. In 1972, he was tried for the murder of Billy Logan, a Teamsters official who was shot in his Chicago neighborhood. Alamon was acquitted in a bench trial. Six years later, in 1978, Alamon was sentenced to 30 years imprisonment. He was convicted under the RICO Act of organizing a series of home invasions. He was released on parole after serving 11 years on April 28, 1989. Roughly 18 months later, in 1991, Alamon pleaded guilty to a money extortion scheme. For that, he was convicted and sentenced to 12 years imprisonment. And then in 1991, Harry Alamon was retried for the 1972 slaying of Billy Logan, making Harry the first American to be retried for murder following a fraudulent first trial. He was found guilty in 1997 and sentenced to 300 years in state prison. And now I would like to introduce you to Harry Alamon's stepdaughter, Frankie Forliano. I saw him as a father. You know, I didn't see him the way other people saw him or the way the news media presented my father out there. So, basic, so basically, I wrote, the, I wrote a story about my father because he was in jail for like 30 years and I wanted to explain it to the public. I wanted people to know the other side of Harry. Harry Alamon. So I wanted them to know the other side of my father's life. That he did have a family that he loved very much and we were all very close. And I was a young girl maybe about nine when my father came into my life, about nine years old, I want to say, or even eight when they start dating. So when my parents start dating, I was a little bit hard to reach because I, I thought my father was there to take her away from us. And as the relationship grew on, you know, went on and on, he basically taught me so many things. And I just fell deeply in love with him. And he was compassionate, he was good. He took me everywhere. He did a lot of one-on-ones. And he even asked permission to marry my mom. And when he did that, at that time, he just became my father. Because as a little girl, I lost my father when I was young. Uh, I want to say my fa I was about three years old when I lost my real father. And after that, I had nobody else, no other father in my life but him and he could never have any children. So he said he fell in love with us as much as he did my mom. He said he called you his little Jap? Yep, his Jewish, Jewish American princess. My mother was Jewish and Jap also because he thought I was pretty sneaky in the way I would attack or defend somebody. And what he meant by that is when my brother was younger he was at the football field playing, and some kid got, got into a fight with him. So when I saw that, my brother got, was on the ground, and before I knew it, I came up to that kid and I just slapped him with everything I had in his face, 
No one expected that. And I just slowly walked away and just went home. And my father said, oh my God, I can't believe it. I can't believe what you did. You just cracked that kid in the face so hard and just walked, walked away from everybody. He said, so that's how I got the name Jap too. And then it was his Jewish American princess and Jap because he said I, I would sneak attack. And that's how that came about. In your book, you say that your father gave you a very special ring. Yes, he did. He gave me a diamond ring. And the reason for the ring was so that I didn't get engaged to anybody just to take a ring. So he said, now we're engaged. So he gave me, um, in fact, I don't have it on, but another time I will wear it. So he gave me a one carat diamond ring. And it was like, it was unbelievable. I was just so excited. He goes, now you, you know, you don't have to take a ring. It's just a guy will come along and you make it all soft about it and he'll give you a ring. And don't take a ring to take a ring. And that's the way I left it. I didn't have to take a ring to take a ring. I was already engaged to my father. So there you go. You also say that you had some very fond memories growing up with Harry and uh, that he bought you, your mother and your family a house. Oh, yes, he did. For the family. He bought us a house in uh, Melrose Park. And yeah, we always had a house full of people. Uh, very family oriented. Dinner on the table every night. Uh, we had a swimming pool in the yard. And his way was he, he liked it better if we stood home. He never liked me to go out or have a sleepover. So all my friends were allowed to come to the house and sleep over. That's the way he liked it. That's the way my mom liked it. That's the way he liked it. And you guys begged for a swimming pool? Oh, yeah, we begged. We begged. I remember he said the first pool we had put in, we laugh about it because we put this. It was, um, it was a pool that was all fenced in, and it was above ground. And he said the guy could have sold it. The guy sold him down the river on that pool. And the pool was never heated, but he told us it was heated. So when we jump in, we thought, oh, God, turn the heat down, you know, as kids. But then eventually, you know, he got us the built-in pool. Nice. With the heater, it worked. <laughs> With the heater. So that was to keep us home. So when did you notice that your father wasn't the average guy with the average job? I mean, what gave that up? Oh, geez. You know, my father was different in the sense that he was very stand-up. He was a man's man. And the definition of that, everybody loved him. Everybody that came around would always be so respectful and always come over to ask him advice and things like that. I didn't really notice anything out of the ordinary other than, well, let me put it to you this way, little bookmaking you know, which I thought was normal. They would take, he would take bets. And he also worked. I mean, he got up every morning and left at 5.30 in the morning. So he worked for the, um, the Sun-Times. He was a driver for the green sheet in the morning. But his job was like maybe an hour and a half, two hours long. So he delivered the green sheet, which was, I don't know, do you know what a green sheet is? All right, if you go to the racetrack, they give you the, the tip sheets on what horses to bet. So he would pick those up and drop those off at the racetrack. And that was his job. And then the rest of the time, like I said, you know, I started to realize they took, well, they, he, maybe a few friends, took bets, which I thought was normal. I don't know. If somebody wanted to bet football or I, I'd overhear this. They would uh, make bets. So I read that one day somebody came to the house unannounced. Oh gosh, yes. That was another thing. I, we weren't allowed to open up the door to strangers or even a friend because my father never trusted anyone. He always said, you never know. Don't let anybody in the house unless I'm home. So if somebody knocked on the door, I would talk through the door and say, you know, oh, is your dad home? No, he's not here or, you know, whatever. They all knew that they couldn't come over. I mean, he didn't think that was respectful to come in another man's house if you were a guy or it was his wife or his daughter there alone. Okay. He didn't like that. So you saw him get into a fight? Uh, yeah, there was a knock at the door one day, and he opened it, and 
he was laying down and I was home. No one else was home at the time. I actually was getting ready to go out. And uh, there was a little confrontation downstairs with the guy. And I heard him screaming at him. So I told you not to come here, never to come to my house. What are you doing here? And yeah, he did punch him a little bit and throw him out. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of just normal. Normal. I okay. didn't think anything of it. Okay. Just like, you know, there would be confrontations. We had two brothers in the house. They'd get in a fight outside the house or somebody would hurt them or beat them up. My father would come, you know, and handle it. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a time that, oh, we lived in an area, it was in, in the city at the time, before we bought our house. And it was across from, well, it was the Austin district. And there was a pickup truck out there. And I remember the story, my brothers were jumping on it. But it was an old, beat up pickup truck. You know, that I do know. And it was a gym teacher's pickup truck at the high school. But the kids were, maybe they were nine, eight, when they were jumping on this truck. He didn't want any problems because the guy came knocking at our door to say that my brothers were jumping on his truck and they dirtied it up and all this stuff. And it was a Sunday. So he went, he opened up the door. He said, you know what, I'm going to go see what's going on. My mother said, oh, my God, please don't get in any trouble, you know. Oh, she's like praying and everything at the table. I'm like, yeah, Dad, don't get in any trouble. Don't get in a fight with anyone. He's like, don't worry about it. I'm not going to get in a fight. I'm just going to go and see what to do about this. He went over there. He got my uncle because my cousin was involved. And they washed and waxed the guy's truck. I don't think he ever washed anybody's, his own vehicle, let alone this guy's truck. So he came home, it was summertime, he was all hot, sweaty. And we get down, we get ready to sit down and eat dinner. You know, my mother makes pasta and meatballs and everything. We're sitting down to go eat. He takes the, the knock at the door came and we're like, oh God, oh no. No, no way. He's just got a napkin on his neck like this and we're gonna eat. And all of a sudden, the knock comes. And they, we're all looking at each other. Because I'm like, I know what's going to happen if this guy keeps harassing my dad. He's going to get in a fight with him. He's going to get beat. He's going to get beat up. So long and short, the guy knocks at the door. My father goes, hold on, everybody. Take it easy. One minute. Give me one minute. I'll be right back in. I promise there's going to be no trouble. Don't worry about me. He comes back in, the poor things. He goes, oh, my God. He's got blood on his T-shirt. We're like, oh, no, dear, come on, really? He goes, what do you want me to do? The guy started with me. He goes, it's always me. I'm the small guy. He didn't pick on your uncle. He's six foot two, but he picked on me. So that's it. Don't worry about it. Let's just eat. I'm starving. So he goes, he changes his shirt. He comes back. We're all sitting down. We're eating now. Another knock comes at the door because I said, oh, no, now what? And my mother's going, now the police are going to come here and everything. Don't worry about it. So the police did come to the door. My father opened the door. And long and short, he had to go over to the police station. And who do you think they locked him up in the cell with? The school teacher. So, of course, he's going to get another beating in the cell. And he did. He came out with a broken nose, crying to his parents. His parents, he was like my dad's age. He's crying to the mom and dad. So that was that story. But dad, I just said, you know, he's just taking care of his family. What was he supposed to do? Normal life. Normal life. Normal life. Right. We grew up in a city. It's, it's rough, and that's how it goes. And there's a lot more in the book. I mean, there's a lot more that you wrote about in the book. Well, we have start? more incidents like that, of course, but... You had what? There were more incidents like that, of course, uh -huh. you know. And, you and there's more that you wrote about in the book. In the book. Yeah, yeah it's in my book. In the book. Yeah. yeah, I don't want to give you the whole story of the book. No, of course not. No, people, no. you got to buy the book. Yeah, if you want to buy the book, look <laughs> at buy the book, here it is. Yeah, if you guys want to buy the book, then just take a look in the description of this video, and there'll be a link. It's at uh, Amazon. So it that is. you can buy Frankie's right book. You got the link. In the, in the description. Yes. 
So tell me a little bit more. Uh, when we were chatting, you said that you, Michael Spilatro, Tony Spilatro. Well, I ate at the restaurant. Okay. We had a restaurant. Had Hoagies? Hoagies Paul. Okay. He actually, I worked for Michael for a little bit. When I was younger, I wanted a job there in the worst way. I was like, oh, I want to work here. And my dad comes, you don't want to work there. Are you kidding? But I said, no, I really do. I really want to work there. So I did finally, well, I was out to dinner with my dad. So on Friday nights, my mother loved to go play cards with her girlfriends. So on Friday nights was like date night. Me and my dad would go out. So he would always take me out. I'd go out to eat with him. And then I'd go home. And then I'd run out with my girlfriends. So actually, we were in there on a Friday, and, and we were talking to Michael. And I said, Michael, I really want to work here. And my dad said, she's driving me crazy. He said, you want to work here, really? I says, yeah. He says, OK, I'll make you a hostess. And then you start whenever you want, and then you can leave. I said, but the only thing is I don't want to stay real late because I want to go out with my friends. Because Faces was real popular back then on Rush Street. And you know, I wanted to go out and dance. So I did work there for maybe a couple weeks because I would uh, I'd want to leave all the time. Because he said, where, where, where are you going? Where are you going? And I just like walk out and I go, I gotta go. My friends are here to pick me up. He's like, oh my God. You know, he thought I was just nuts. And then they go to pay me a paycheck. I'll never forget it. I was ashamed to get paid. I was so embarrassed to take pay. That was the worst part about working is I didn't want to be paid for it and you're supposed to get paid so he's like you know I got a check for you like when I came in to eat after that we got a check for you They're, it's in the it's in the office I go I don't need the check get out he goes what do you mean get out you got a paycheck you worked you got to come in you deserve to be paid you know I never would take the check but yeah I knew him very well very well so you also knew lefty Rosenthal? Yes, I did know Lefty from coming um, to Vegas to go to the Stardust. And he was uh, a really nice guy. I knew him because my uncle worked at the Stardust. And he was uh, in the Baccarat pit. I had a boyfriend that worked that I met through him. And I was young. And he was a dealer, a blackjack dealer. And I would come out to Vegas all the time to visit my uncle. I'd stay like a month or two. You know, at first, my dad's like, you're not going to Vegas. Get out of here. But his brother would call up and say, oh, let her come. Let her come. I go, what's the big deal? I want to go see what it's like. It would be fun for me. And I loved it. I came out. I got the excitement. And the strip was dazzling. And swimming. And I'm getting tan. And I'm not paying for anything. This was wonderful. You get comp to eat dinner. They brought you free cigarettes. I, I thought, where am I at? Disney World? I absolutely loved it. And that was back in the 70s. That was in the 70s. That now. was in the 70s. That was in the 70s. Now, here we are in 2020. You've made trips uh, between then and now. Sure. Oh, it's so different. What was different about it? Oh, okay, I will tell you. It was fantastic back then. I mean, this... It was just like, like I said, it was Disney World. The people were sharp. Everybody was dressed. You did not go into a casino unless you were dressed head to toe. I mean, dresses and shoes and clothes. And you just wanted to shop. And there were boutiques. And you'd buy, I remember I bought alligator boots. I mean, $1,000 boots. You were gambling. You were winning. It was, it was just exciting. And then they even taught me how to gamble out here. So... Like how to hold the money, don't put it back on the table. Take 25 out, you put the 25, I'm playing blackjack. They taught me how to play, it was like put the 25 down. Okay, hit me, okay you got 50. Me, I couldn't go the whole route, so I would pull the 25 back, put it in my bag. Now I'd split, 10 for you and 10 for me. So I didn't do, you know, just like the real gamblers, the way they did it was even better. I mean, they just let it roll. But I would let it roll, but I would pull back. So I made money. I mean, I made a lot of money coming out here. And um, it was fascinating because there were shows. I saw, oh God, I saw so many shows. And the shows were, you know, all comped. You didn't have to pay. The dinners were like gourmet. I mean, 
it's it's not the same because like there's no there was a dress code. People dressed up. People were classy. They were everybody was nice. Well, there were a lot of people from Chicago out here. To be honest with you, a lot of Chicago, a lot of New York. Everybody's kid that couldn't get a job at home went to Vegas and went to work at the casinos. And that's the truth. It was everybody's kid. They loved it. And the guys were all handsome. The girls were pretty. Today it's different. It's just not like that. It's not the same Vegas. They built these big corporations. They don't want to comp you. They don't want you to win any money. They, they tightened the machines up. I mean, it wasn't like that. It was fun. A lot of fun. A lot of fun back then. A lot of fun. Way different. And the bars. Oh, please. Because you go naturally with, well, all these guys living out here. I knew them all. So I didn't go on the strip. You know what I mean? All right, you went there a little bit to play because they worked there. After that, it was all fun. They had clubs that had phones where they'd ring the phone and a guy could talk to you at another table. I remember that bar like so good. I just thought it was so fascinating. Like if a guy wanted to send you a drink, he would just ring the phone at your table and he'd go, hi, I think you're really good looking. Can I send you a drink? I'm at table number three, or I'm at table number four. Every table had a phone. It was the coolest club I had ever been in. And it was so fun, because you're sitting there with your girlfriends, and I mean, this phone's ringing off the hook. Because these guys are just unbelievable. I mean, they were just crazy back then. So that was another club. And then there were, um, oh my God, there was such dinner. I went to all the local places that they took me to. Like all these guys, I mean, my God, I knew everybody that worked at the casinos. Everybody's sons were working there. So we hung out, you know, we'd party. Did you ever go to the gold rush? I never went there. I knew of the gold rush. I knew they opened it, but I never personally went in there. So back when the mob was in control of Las Vegas, would you say that it was better or would you say that it was worse? How do you feel about that? Actually, Vegas was a better place. Uh, it was the era when Lefty Rosenthal was here. He had a TV show. He had a lot of things going on. He just treated people so well. And, and Vegas was well run. You know, the corporations came in and took it over because of whatever they said they were doing, they were stealing from the casinos or whatever. But when the big corporations came here, I think it ruined it. Yeah. It ruined it. Um, you said to me that you knew Lefty's driver? I did. I did know his driver. I actually dated him when I was younger. Okay. And he wasn't driving him the night that? No, he was sick. He was sick the night of Tony Roma's, the car bomb. Yes, he was sick that night. Luckily for him, he was sick. You know, because when I heard about it, I had talked to him and I said, oh my God, because didn't you know I was driving? I go, no, I didn't know that. Dear God, are you kidding me? He goes, luckily, I, you know, I was sick. I had a cold. I was home in bed that night. I go, thank God. Wow, I've never heard that story before. And I mean, I've been doing the mob tours. For oh, that. my God, oh, you're I kidding. Around, yeah. around. I thought he drove no, himself No, no, no. He had him drive at him. Wow. The poor guy was probably scared to drive himself around for a reason like that, maybe. Who knows? I mean, there was a lot of underhanded things going on back then. I mean, other people came here. I mean, I knew Tony was out here. So, yeah. He had a reason to be shook up. Yeah. I mean, we all know the wife's story there. Yeah. Tony and Jerry McGee. Yeah, we know that, you know, because of the shows you heard before me. Sure. So there's no, it's not, it's not new. No. And it was out there in the movie. So they tell you right out that he was going with the wife. Yeah. And the other guy, you know, poor Lefty, what was he going to do? Sure. Probably was scared the man. Shaking from her. And she was with the drugs and... This poor man's running back and forth, trying to take care of his child. And you got a woman on drugs that he married. I mean, he loved her. You know, he wasn't like the, a gorgeous looking man. 
he was just a really nice, quiet man. And the girl that he married was more like a dancer type on the wild side. Yeah. So back to your father. Yes. Okay. So one day the police showed up at the house and arrested your father. That is exact. Well, yeah, that's what happened. He actually, yeah, that, that is what happened. The police showed up one day and arrested him. Um, I'm trying to think of something that was more important than what you just said. Did they come to the house and arrest him that day? How did that all come about? I think, no, I think he had a subpoena. They didn't come to the house and arrest him that day. The first original start of this, they had a subpoena for him. And actually, I've never even put this in the book because there's so many stories, I can't put them all in a book. He actually wasn't, when the subpoena came out, he left. And he said, I have to go away for a while. He knew he was going to be indicted. I didn't know these things then. And he said to, he sat us down and he said, kids, I got something, I got some problems coming my way. I don't want you to be scared. I'm going to go away for a little bit. Me and your mom are going to go, we're going to take off for a little bit, which was fine. I actually, after that point, I'm thinking, he went away, they went to Mexico is where they went. And... We were gonna each go one at a time to go spend on a vacation with my dad. My brother went first, then he sent my brother back. Then I was supposed to go, I didn't wind up going. My mother went, and my mother went on vacation with my father. On the way home from Mexico, he got grabbed in Texas, is what happened. Because my mother called the house, my mother was delayed, he got grabbed in Texas, and that's when all the problems started out there. He, they were beating him up with steel pillows all over. Yeah, they were hitting him. They have ways of beating you up without showing marks on you. So if they beat you up with a, the police, if they have a, they put steel on a pillow, and if they whack you with it, you won't bruise. And um, that's what happened out there. But he did come back. He did turn himself in, and then he had to go to court. And he was charged with the murder of Billy Logan? They, they were charging him with the murder of William Logan, which was Billy Logan. And what happened there, he sat us down, he explained it. He said, I'm going to tell you something right now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get in trouble for something. I might go to jail even, but I want you to know it's for something I didn't do. I've done a lot of things in my life that I'm not proud of, and some things I am. But I'm going to wind up getting in trouble, and I think I might even wind up going to jail for this. And we were just like all freaked out. And then he sat us down, he calmed us down. We even hired, he even hired bodyguards in the house because he said he felt threatened by the FBI. Because they were making it like he was such a bad guy, like he was John Dillinger. Mm -hmm. So everybody on, on the face of earth was petrified of my father. That's how bad the newspaper articles start coming in. And he was on every TV, so he said, I don't even want you guys to watch TV anymore. We, he ripped the phones right out of the walls of the house. So you think it was the media that turned him into a monster? Oh, yeah, definitely was the media. Because we had to get rid of the phones, first off. I mean, that's pretty hard. You're growing up. You can't get a phone call. God forbid you have a, a you want to go out with your friends or a guy's gonna, a boyfriend's going to call you. What do you tell these people? Oh, I don't have a phone. We, we didn't have a phone because he said, you know, they're going to, somebody's going to say something on the phone or their phones are wired. So he just one day ripped the phone out of the wall. And that was that. So we just got used to no phone. Why this was all going on, we didn't have a phone in the house. I remember that. Would you say that Harry was violent? Never. With Not with me or in my family. You said his childhood was a bit rough? He oh, had a hard life. My father he had a hard life. His father was very uh, much of a disciplinarian. And he had a clean house. And his father would go around with the white glove, you know, and smack him around. That he did do.
daily? Pretty much. He was in trouble for everything. He was the oldest brother, so he caught the most punishment out of it. He did. He did catch the most punishment. Now, your dad went to trial for this uh, murder of Billy Logan. And he had some witnesses show up. I don't want to tell your whole book. No. Of course. He had witnesses that showed up, but mm -hmm. at any rate, um, they didn't convict him of that trial. He got let go. It was fantastic. We were all happy. We were going through the ringer, my family. I mean, they were calling him a monster, uh -huh. uh, the, a cancer on this earth. So everybody and anybody that wanted to know about Harry Alamon, it was no secret now. Because now they were saying he was um, a hitman and he was a killer. I mean, I have to go to school. You know, you have to go to work. You have to face the world. So the only way to go through it was to be like he was. Put everybody on the pay me no mind list. You don't pay my bills. You don't, you don't own me. So the way I looked at life is if you ask me something directly, I'll do my best to answer it. If not, I didn't care what you thought. You know, I, I wasn't pleased about it. You know, he was my father. It, it's, you block it out. You don't want to hear all this garbage about your father. You don't want to sit down and, and see him on the news every night, which we were doing. He was on the news forever. In news, newspapers, uh, biography channels they made of him, they had all kinds of stuff. I can't tell you how many things. And if you Google his name, you'll see. Google Harry Alamon, see what comes up. It tells you his early activities uh, as a kid growing up, uh, about pushing a woman through the plate glass window and his first arrest. You know, it was a police commander's son. I mean, the very first time. Now I'm reading about stuff. You know, my dad's going through all these things and I'm learning more and more. And then computers became popular, so you learned and you read and you read. Even though you weren't supposed to, you're curious. And, and you don't want to be judgmental. He was a wonderful father to me. I couldn't ask for more. And, you know, taught me respect, taught me to respect my elders. And please, he taught me how to walk. He taught me how to do everything. I wanted to, to, to go to modeling school and stuff. And he's like, you don't need it, I'll teach you. I was walking around the house with a book on my head. I mean, he was just great. So to see this other dark side, this scary side that people saw, can you imagine? I mean, who in the hell would want to date you? I mean, they, they, guys were scared, you know. Oh, is that your father? Oh, my God. I hope he doesn't shoot me. I mean, they come out with stupid stuff, and then you're like, I'm done with this guy. I'm done with him. You know, I hope he doesn't shoot me or... It caused a lot of heartache in my life, okay? I could tell you that. Nobody wants to, in-laws don't want you. So I've been married and divorced because they get intimidated by it. I mean, I had a mother-in-law that was like horrible to me. Why? Because she heard about my father. And that, that was enough for either people hated you or they loved you. Either you were waiting on hand and, and hand and foot or nothing at all. They hate you or they love you. So that's the way that went. Wow. So he got arrested later on, but this time it was for racketeering? Yes, he did. He, he wound up, they came and they arrested him again. And at that point, wait a minute. They came to the house. Actually, they came to the house. I was home with the cleaning lady. Nobody was home. Me, again, by myself. With the cleaning lady that just got done cleaning the house. This, this, the poor woman. I mean, she was our cleaning woman for, like, ever. She just got done cleaning. And the doorbell rings. And we've got a... My dad had a Hungarian Vistla dog. And this dog was just going like crazy. I opened the door, they got their guns out. I'm like, you know what, do you have a warrant? I mean, at least I learned how to talk. Do you have a warrant? Uh, just let me, I'm not letting you in without showing me a warrant. 
Well, I knew it was going to probably take them three minutes to get a warrant, which they did. They left. Maybrook was around the corner. They went right and came right back in. And they told me, put the dog behind the gates or we're going to shoot your dog. They had every gun out. Twelve guys bust through the house. They wrecked the entire house. I mean, they literally had their hands sweeping through the cabinets, telling me to stand back. Before they got back, I took everything of my mother's and put it on me. My mother's jewelry, her diamonds, my dad's phone book. Nobody ever got it. I burned it. I burned that. Now I can say it. They never got his phone book because I stuck it in here because my dad always said, if anybody ever comes to this house, you know where all my stuff is, right? Yep, yep, yep. You take it. You take it. You know what to do. I did. So I took his phone book. I stashed it at me. The funny thing I'm going to tell you, and it's going to be funny now, when my dad goes through all this hell of a life with the police break coming in and the warrants and he goes back in and out, and we don't want to tell the people everything like you said, and he goes through all this disruption in his life, I'll just tell him for the first time that he, he goes to jail, comes out, now it's 11 years have gone by. He did 11 years. He did 11 years now. He comes back. And I go, guess what, Dad? Proud as a peacock. I got your phone book. He said, what? <laughs> I'll never forget it. He said, no, you don't. Burn that. <laughs> I said, he goes, it's got so many phone numbers in it. And, you know, I, you know, out of curiosity, when he was gone, I leafed through that phone book. But there's, it had a lot of stuff in it. But I will tell you this. I burned it. I ran and had a bonfire with him, and he said, it. "He's like you don't have that phone book still." And I go, "Yeah, I saved it for you. You know, I saved your clothes, your golf clubs. You know, I saved your stuff." But yeah, that was that was that's the part that I get a little little humor out of, not drudging to the prison, of course, which I did. And my mom, my brothers, my sisters, we went to prison for thirty years. He went to prison. We went to prison with him. So that I could tell you. I think you said in your book that when he was first arrested, you were traveling to, was it Texas? It Atlanta, right there in Chicago. You Atlanta, were... Georgia. Atlanta, okay. He had to go to Atlanta. It was horrible. Um, we went to, oh my God, every prison. It's like you're on the circuit, and they just keep moving you. He was in Milan, Michigan. He was in... Dixon, he was in Atlanta, Georgia. I can't even think of all the prisons, but there were so many of them. Those were all, you know, the federal prisons at that time. No, I'm mixing state up with federal now. See that? I caught myself. He was in federal prison this time, the first time. So, yeah, he was in Atlanta, Georgia. And that was a, a trip. Okay. A scary one at that. So he got out after 11 years? Yep. And he spent uh, about 18 months at home? At home. And then the state did a double jeopardy on him? And this was the second time he was being tried for the same thing? They came after him for something else. They came after him for another indictment. And his lawyer at the time said, hey, let's, this isn't good for your father, blah, blah, blah. My dad came, sat us down, talked to us as a family, and said, what do you think I should do? We said, make a plea. Is, is that what you have, you know, so you could never go back to jail? Not a plea that he's going to tell on anybody else, just a plea that, okay, I'll confess to this, that I was a bookmaker or whatever it is, that I, you know, took money off of him. So that's what he confessed to, and then he went back to jail. But he was only supposed to do like eight years. And at the time, the lawyer said, he said, please, could he ever go to jail again? Please, no more, no more jail. He said he will never go to jail again. But what they failed to tell us is that he could go to jail again from the state. This was a federal indictment. So all this time he was doing was federal. So now he's doing like 18 years already federal. You know, he comes out for a year and a half, he's back in jail. And then he comes out, I mean, he never comes out. 
He never comes out because he indicted him again in jail for murder. And this was the second time he was being tried for the same thing. Now it was for the same thing. Right. Which the William says, Which you're not supposed to be able to do that. Which was considered, we thought for sure they couldn't do that, it was a double jeopardy. We're like, no way, it's a double jeopardy. There's no way. Well, this is we didn't believe it. None of us believed it. None of us believed it. That they could try you and do this. And that he was the first case in history. It's kind of historical if you read about his name. You said just recently that uh, Smollett brought up your father's case. Right. Yes, I think it was Judge Tuman, the same judge my father had. Mm -hmm. And he brought up the case, and I thought, oh, my God, you're kidding me. And he brought up the case. He cited that case for, because uh, there's Judge Tuman still in office. Mm -hmm. But it was, uh, it was bad because we never saw it coming thought here's this poor man's done 18 years already what more do they want and now they come back with this and I think that was for themselves for the prosecutors were still the same people were still in the same position they made a name for themselves now they got new people coming up with stories that they didn't come up with from years ago so it all changes things. It, it changes. Witnesses. witnesses are dead. The, his witnesses, yeah. The witnesses for my father were now passed away and dead. And now this changes things because now you have these, uh, well, actually, they went to the same people because one of the witnesses was this Louis Almeida. He was already in jail, tried to kill himself, and he just wanted to get out of jail. He tried to get out the first time and testified against my dad, but they knew he was a liar. I mean, he, his, they showed that he was a liar. They showed that he was desperate. I mean, when they were prosecutors or whatever, when they went to go pick him up, they said he was laying in a puddle of urine. And they pulled him out of there and said, what do you need, buddy? Come on, let's go. You just testify against Harry Allen and we'll take care of you. That's what I knew, that's what I got of it, and that is the truth. That's what they did. Then they went and got, um, oh, who else did they get in there t at the time? Bob Cooley. He goes, he's another one. He's a, he's a, he was a police officer, became a lawyer, became a drug addict, became owing everybody. He was a gambling degenerate, owed everybody money. My father said, I don't even know this guy. You know, I don't even know him. I never knew him, so how did my dad know him? I usually knew every single person my father knew. I mean, he took us all over with him. I went for breakfast with him. I saw people that he talked to. I mean, in the morning, in the afternoon. I, he took me with him, so I knew this guy I never knew. Never heard of him, nothing. But I had heard that he was a bad person. I knew that about him. Because another guy that prior to that that I had dated knew him. Because he was a lawyer, and this guy was a lawyer. And they said he was on Counselor's Row, which was a restaurant. And he was the biggest stool pigeon in the world. So why would my father have a guy like this around him? We already knew he was bad. That's the funny part. So now they bring this guy to court to say that the judge was bribed. Where was he 10 years before that? Why did he come then? He waits till the judge kills himself. Okay, the judge had cancer, they don't tell you that either. They don't tell you that the judge's nephew testified for my father either. He was in the courtroom and he was testifying because his uncle never had one bad case in his whole life, except my father. So they ruined this poor judge's credentials, destroyed this man. And his nephew was very upset about that and that's what he came to court for. Not because we knew him, not because he knew my father, there to clear up the name of his uncle who had never had one bad case how could it be the guy one case in his life and it's my dad's so this story goes deep oh it's deep, so deeper. deep what webs so what, what webs did. of lies they did a lot they were corrupt they well, were corrupt everybody knows that the court system the police they all are corrupt they were corrupt yet that they were so corrupt they wanted to make names for themselves. Newspapers were big. Don't forget you sold a lot of newspapers. The more you talked about outfit, gangsters, this, that.
the more people, they loved it. They loved it, and that is the era I grew up in. And all of that you wrote in your book? I did. I, you know, the only thing I didn't do in my book is I didn't put a lot of pictures in it because I wrote the book. It really, it took me probably a year and a half to write the book. And there's so much to tell. Nobody understands how hard it is to write a book. Mm -hmm. And if they think it's easy, it's not because my stories can go on endlessly. And people could ask me questions and I can go on and on. And I did a, a station on uh, TV, I, a Reels TV channel. They ask you off the wall questions, so you really can't defend yourself when you do those type of interviews because you don't know what they're going to say. I mean, they say, oh, we're going to say good things, or you could talk about your dad, and you could do this. But by the time they edited it, but even though they edited it, I still did good in the interview. And I wasn't pre prepared for that at all because they did like 10 other people. So they made that sound good. So, I mean, it, it's just crazy. I could have went, like I said, writing the book was not easy. Then all of a sudden, believe it or not, I come out to Vegas. I still had half the book left to write. I wrote half the book. It took me a long time. I get to Vegas, I write the other half in, in three weeks. I mean, I don't know what happened. The mountains, something. But it just cleared my head and I could think. And I said, I've got to finish this book. So that's why there wasn't a lot of pictures or, let, you know, I'm thinking of getting back into it. It's just, I want to write a second book. Where do I start? Do I start with his early life? Do I start with his middle life? I want to know more what people want to know. So I'll tell you what, everybody, the link to Frankie's book is in the description. You can click on it. You can download it from Kindle. Uh, you can buy a paperback copy. Whatever you want to do, read the book. It's great. But it is fascinating, her story. Read it. And then if you have any questions or maybe you you have uh, you know, a question, it leave real. it in the comments below. And maybe that'll help her uh, with ideas for a second book. Or, Frankie, maybe you'd come back on here and answer some questions. Frankie, thank you so much. Thank you for having me on. No, we appreciate you being here. You're welcome. Here.